now uh, welcome back to uh, today's uh, morning lecture uh, but uh, i would just like to uh, refresh uh, uh, you all with this uh, you know, whatever we are discussing yesterday uh, evening on this intentional uh, relationship between the subject uh, the self and uh, the world the environment and this intentional relationship uh, is proposed by uh, a philosophical school called phenomenological school um, phenomenology is one of the methodology uh, which has been used very significantly to talk about uh, to study fields uh, to uh, to prepare field reports or, uh, or take a direct interview of uh, things to have a first hand experience or what we call the first person perspective of uh, the world now a uh, little bit uh, uh, theoretical background is necessary to understand what is uh, it to have a phenomenological uh, or intentional uh, relationship between the subject and the object self and uh, the world this idea here is uh, uh, the self is a conscious self and uh, consciousness as we all know something very intrinsic to human life uh, human beings are conscious uh, but what is uh, specific about human consciousness is that uh, they have various other uh, properties uh, or other features such as uh, you know intentionality uh, rationality uh, perspectivality etc etc so a dozen of such features of human consciousness uh, what is important is uh, this that consciousness always have a some kind of property that is it is directed at something or whenever we say that we are conscious we are conscious of something so this offness or aboutness that we see uh, when we talk about consciousness uh, the, so for example i am conscious i am if somebody asks what are you conscious of so consciousness is always having this feature called you know some kind of an offness or aboutness in it so this intrinsic feature is called intentionality phenomenologists have uh, theorized this notion of intentionality that human consciousness is intentional and i as i also pointed out that this intentionality is uh, also a biological feature because other living beings are also conscious but in the case of human beings this intentionality is uh, self reflexive it is a self reflexive feature in the sense that you know it it has the capacity to recognize things so now recognition helps us constructing the notion of identity and we all aspire to have our own identity it's not it so it is in that context one can think of that how intentionality is uh, you know, an intrinsic feature of all biological beings and that helps in the case of human being it connects necessarily connects the self with the world and this necessary connection is intentional in nature and that further helps us developing the sense of identity it is in this context uh, martin buber talks about uh, uh, that how the self is not an isolated uh, entity uh, self is always uh, been conceptualized individual conceptualizes one's own identity along with the other but it tries to understand itself you uh, know in relationship with uh, other so being in relationship with other that is what is important so being is always uh, in a kind of a uh, relationship with uh, other so that relationship is an intentional relationship so please keep that uh, in mind and uh, then uh, self has two uh, different intentional modes uh, of relations one is the i eat relationship and there is also uh, i thou relationships so in the case of i eat and i thou relationship do not represent different things but two different possible relations between self and an object or self and the world or self and the other 
So, uh, this is what uh, um, uh, Buber is trying to conceptualize in his uh, theoretical uh, framework that whether uh, the kind of self that we uh, possess today is developed through this I eat relationship with the world or I thou relationship with the world that has to be studied and re examined when we talk about uh, uh, environmental uh, ethics. Now, in the case of I eat relationship, uh, one one can um, he says that this, this subject object uh, relationship symbolizes a kind of an experience or the kind of use which depends upon an object or a thing. So, if I consider the other biotic beings or non human entities or non human beings as an object, object to suffice uh, or to fulfill my uh, interest, my needs. So, it is in that context I have a kind of a uh, relationship where I consider that object uh, the, that being as an object, not the being as being, okay, being as an object. So, it is an unilateral experience where I is, I is active and does not treat the object capable of entering into a relationship bound by mutuality. Now, as I told you that this is an intentional relationship uh, and I also mentioned uh, later in the second half of my uh, lecture that this intentional relationship helps us communicating things to the others. And there were many questions uh, in this uh, uh, context was raised that how do we motivate our students, uh, how do you motivate them you know, uh, or how do we guide them so that they become a kind of a moral agent, they become they show responsibility. Uh, towards uh, environmental issues that they try to resolve certain environmental issues. Now, this communication look at this important uh, concept communication. So, the communication is happening between the two individual when you talk about communication what Buber calls uh, a dialogue. Okay. Dialogue happens between the two uh, individual. In the case of I, I consider I as a uh, self and the object. Now, I when I try to communicate with the object or when I treat the other uh, being as an object, then I really do not communicate. I only try to predict, try to judge whatever is given to me. So, it is in that context, I create some kind of a hindrance, not that I am engaged intentionally with the object, but the object is also intentionally connected with me. And this is what is uh, um, what is very important. Now, Buber's very interesting example has been well depicted if, uh, if anybody has seen this uh, um, movie uh, Wednesday, where now these two uh, co-passengers who are traveling in the train, they try to you know uh, communicate with each other looking at their eyes, the, the, there is no verbal communication, but still their gestures uh, make lot of sense to each other. So, and one feels for the other, okay. though they do not know each other, they are completely not having any verbal communication. So, it is in that context, if you uh, talk about a dialogue or a communication. So, communication can happen without any uh, language uh, per se. So, it, so, language here transcends uh, what we call uh, language in our ordinary or everyday life. So, communication is a two way process and when I considers the other as an object, so there is no two way relationship, there is only one way relationship. Okay. But if I treat the other as a subject, if I treat the other as a subject, then there is a communication. I invite the other uh, to to uh, to me, and I treat that uh, the other is equal to me. So it is in that sense a double relationship is uh, established, and all communication demands such a uh, reflexive, intentional relationship. That is what uh, uh, Buber says. It is an unilateral experience where I is active. You are actively predicting the other. I I, I um, uh, emphasize that you are actively, uh, actively predicting, actively studying others and does not treat the object capable of entering into a relationship. 
you are studying but you are not allowing it you are not inviting it to uh, no, uh, uh, to you so there is no mutual relationship so there is no mutuality between the subject and the object the, the object remains outside the subject uh, the, the object remains outside the realm of this intentional relationship though you are intentionally trying to connect but this intentionality is only helping you uh, you to predict the object so uh, not to understand the object so understanding can only happen communication can develop a good understanding if and only if there is a double way relationship which exists and this is very very important but in the case of i thou relationship when i treat the other as a, a kind of a subject other is uh, important to me then there is a relationship um, um, there is a constant communion as, as i said there is a constant communion between these two and this relationship is a relationship of love uh, uh, is some kind of a liking towards the other some kind of a uh, compassion is shown towards the other in the case of animal ethics which we are going to uh, study uh, after a few minutes uh, we will see that that how uh, this moral agent tries to have a compassion or expresses compassion towards other and that is what is uh, necessary uh, if you would like to have something like uh, animal rights uh, as we are having uh, no human rights and things like that and if you are proposing the theory of animal rights then we need to cultivate a deep sense of compassion love etc and and that will help us you know developing a newer self or that will renew our self in a in a better way which i was talking about the renewal of the self so it is a direct and intense mutual relationship so i thou relationship not only treats the other as an equal partner but that is a mutual relationship so intentionality is operating in two ways not only the, uh, not only to, uh, from the self to the world or you know, self to the environment or other biotic beings but also from the biotic beings to the, the self so there are two ways in which you are connected you are and that is what is called uh, the mutual relationship in which one meets the other as genuinely different than oneself but as someone who is uh, with whom one can enter into an active relationship so whereas in the case of i eat relationship the self is passively related with uh, the object or the self is passively related with the animals or the uh, the environment whatever is our and the subject of our study so it is in that uh, connection uh, buber differentiates between when a conversation or a dialogue or an engagement is passive and when it becomes active and in the case of an active um, communication active dialogue the dialogue uh, represents a kind of a intense mutual relationship whereas in the case of uh, a passive uh, um, communication there is no mutual relationship there is an absence of mutual relationship hence no understanding develops so the active mutual relationship is grounded on various virtues like love compassion non violence etc etc so many people who have talked about deep ecology like arnenes have borrowed these from oriental traditions where buddha gandhi have intensely advocated on theorized this concepts of non violence and compassion uh, when you talk about uh, or when you try to articulate this notion of moral agent we need to uh, look at uh, this concept of uh, uh, an intentional relation that exist between the uh, the self and the world the self and the other non human beings and the self uh, and the other environment environment as other so i so 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 that is what i think i had not explained yesterday and it is necessary to understand this if we are trying to uh, understand the notion of moral agency because a moral agent is not only a rational agent but he is a compassionate person and he is capable of rationalizing thinking sacrificing there are so many um no, normative attitudes which can be developed uh, if we uh, 
little deeply think about our own self. So, uh, before making any judgment, before making any choice or performing any action, if we try to reflect upon all these concepts, then that will help us developing a concept of moral agency. So, in the case of moral agency, it is important that we make a distinction between moral agency and moral subjects. Now, there is no uh, concept of moral object, the animals are not to be treated as an object, the environment per se is not to be treated as an object. So, rather we revise the terminology and treat that as a kind of a, a subject or replace it using this term moral subjects. So, animals are no more moral objects, they are or they are not no more patients, they are rather moral subjects. And we uh, with these capacities that is the capacities uh, to or the ability to perform moral judgments, ability to uh, know, uh, get engaged in moral deliberation, ability to make decisions, the ability to have self answerability or accountability, all these makes us moral agent. Okay. So, moral agents has a kind of a double uh, responsibility. He is not only there to perform duties, not only there to care for others, but also there to express a deeper sense of responsibility towards other. So, that makes us something very significant. So, we are not only not merely rational beings, we are not merely conscious beings, rather we are thinking beings. Martin Heidegger tells us that we have the world is facing this crisis today precisely because we have stopped the thinking, we are no more thinking. Thinking means thinking critically, thinking critically to address the problems that we encounter, thinking critically to resolve the issues that, uh, no, that matters to us. So, therefore, it is important for all of us to have a collective thinking, because a collective thinking can help or can guide us, can show us a good path how to resolve certain normative issues that we face when we deal with uh, environmental crisis. So, this is what I would like to talk before I get into another discussion on animal ethics. So, I will briefly take maybe uh, two or three questions and then get into the new topic called animal ethics. Thank you. Yes, sir, you have any question? Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, kindly indicate the clear cut distinction between moral and ethics. Ethics is nothing but theory Hello, of sir. moral. If you have seen my first slide that I used uh, yesterday, it clearly says ethics is nothing but about theory of morals. Morality deals with what is good, bad, correct or incorrect, right or wrong and when we theorize them, then you have an ethics. Okay. So, ethics deals with values. Okay. Is that clear? Sir, clear sir. One more, one more question sir. Okay. How can we encourage environmental ethics in citizens and students? Encourage. Now, we need to practice it. Now, what is important is that we have stopped practicing it. Say for example, a small example, save electricity or save energy, save water. Okay. Forget about pollution, the use, the kind of use uh, that we are habituated with is something can be done at a personal level. Now, if we start doing it at a personal level, at the, at the institutional level called family, then our children are encouraged to save water, save drinking water I mean. Similarly, if we say that, if we share our thoughts you know, in our neighborhoods. So, education here means educating every individual. So, therefore, environmental ethics talks about a collective responsibility, responsibility which will to be said not only at the institutional level, not only in the classrooms, but in many other forums where such an education is necessary. Thank you sir. Thank welcome, you. Welcome, welcome. As in Solapur district, okay. 24 kilometer Great Indian Bastard Sanctuary was there, 8500 okay. square kilometer. Okay. Now, the area reduced. Okay. It was now 1220 square kilometer okay. and now again 
300 square kilometer uh -huh. this is a dilapidation of the great indian bus stand uh -huh. in 1989 40 birds were there and now only 3 uh -huh. what about the ethics what about the central government do and no any uh, radiometry or other practices govern there yes so what about the ethics uh, role of ethics. environment department regarding this bird it is in iucn red data book highly sensitive so this is my question now i understand your feeling see the policy makers prepare their policies or policy documents they don't look at the reality from a moral point of view they only look at it from a economic point of view and that is what has given birth to this kind of crisis that which is very unfortunate in india but i'm sure with more enlightened uh, generation to come people will be very actively engaged in debates and that debates will give birth to movements social movements that this is how environment will directly and indirect will affect our quality life okay and that probably will be you know a kind of a welcoming situation so we will create a welcoming situations but unfortunately in our country it is uh, absent such a situation is absent people only look at uh, not the social reality only from an economic point of view not from moral point of view so moral point of view so many farmers their land the, uh, it is not in practice so these suffered all these peoples they suffer from only three birds so according to the point that of view is, of the farmers wrong. it is see wrong. that is what is something wrong happening and we should not encourage that but unfortunately it is keeps on happening one more question i want uh, you to convey our uh, environmental ethics of as a whole globe and also about our india as a country the ethics is uh, not so much followed in order to avoid the terrorism in order to avoid uh, some uh, water uh, waste uh, which are uh, disposed in our rivers for example yes ha uh, in ganga and so many all the religious materials which are dumping we are which are disposing into the river Yes, into yes. the in our lakes uh, all these are the uh, puja materials and also idols all these uh, all should be avoided uh, to the minimum possible extent in order to uh, minimize the water pollution in our city it is important that we critically reflect on those events which are occurring in our day to day life and we all think that our religion and religious beliefs needs uh, to be little rationalized okay if somebody throws a dead body to ganga and says that uh, the, his soul will be liberated and that seriously pollute the river ganga and uh, look at what kind of uh, religion it is now it is time has come that we should critically think about what is good for the humanity every religion needs to be modernized every culture needs to be modernized so uh, cultural beliefs need to be modernized and that depends upon how uh, rational our individual citizens are now in a we are living in a country where our foods are sold we sell our foods so uh, that we, we cannot blame others but it is important for all of us to live up to a kind of a moral standard where our personal the dignity of an individual is restored the autonomy of an individual is restored so then only we can consider ourselves as a thinking individual and we can uh, not only enlighten our activities but also can guide others to do good so uh, but i don't want to comment on terrorism i have uh, i am not here to do that yes, good morning sir i've got a question so when handling uh, ethics for students in classroom how can we actually improve the active relationships sir that is professional ethics when you're handling uh, in classroom i under teaching is a two way process a teacher when goes to classroom he thinks that he is one of the you know uh, the brightest intelligent fellow and the other students are her you know uh, nothing so this hierarchy creates a hindrance in the process of understanding and 
and the process of learning. So, teaching goes along with learning and learning is a two way process. So, when we consider the student as a, as a partner of this process of learning, then we collectively learn. So, similarly, when we try to project environmental issues to our fellow students, try to see that they uh, or we try to expose them to certain environmental crisis, that then possibly they will learn much better than in the classroom teaching. We have to come to a level uh, of their understanding, so that we collectively learn and that will be a great motivating factor. This is what I believe. Thank you, sir. Sir, I have got uh, one more question, sir. We have got one more question. Okay. My question is actually, early Christian church, their basically their development was based upon uh, ethics, uh, basically they are speaking about certain theology. How can we basically compare the development theology of uh, the early church and our present conservational ethics with respect to whatever development is taking place in a country or a global level or whatever it is? So, Early church was uh, very much uh, not conservative. Uh, basically, they were telling that uh, nature is like our mother. Basically, we should not harm all those things, theology, philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how can we basically tell Marshall is one of the pioneers of uh, deep ecology. He is speaking about uh, conservation ethics. How can we compare both, sir? Because while taking the classes, how can we basically give these ideas to the students? I understand there are two modes in which we cultivate our ethics, morality. The classical approach, as I pointed out in my last lectures, is based upon an ethics called anthropocentric ethics, that human have always considered themselves superior to others. Whereas, in the case of life centric ethics, the humans are treated at par with other non-human beings. So, because life is becomes a connecting principle okay, and it is on the basis of that one can talk about equality, one can talk about conservation um, etcetera, etcetera. But if we cultivate the anthropocentric world view, then there will be exploitations and there will be a serious threat as it is been happening from uh, no, centuries. Uh, so, there are two points of views one has to uh, keep in mind. Uh, one is the anthropocentric world view and another is the life centric world, world view. The ethics that we the currently been advocated is based on a life centric uh, world. Is that clear? Thank you sir. Okay.